Welcome back to another episode of Vancouver Real. My name is Andy Zaremba, and this is our second episode of the day. And as usual, we're recording out of 70 West Cordova Street here in Gastown, Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And this is the third installment of the TEDx Stanley Park series. And I'm really excited to introduce the guest, which I'll get to in just a minute. Um, but as usual, I have to mention our sponsor, Float House. And if you've never heard of floating before, go to the website, floathouse.ca. And uh, there's a great video on there called uh, the What is Floating video. Or if you're just on YouTube, type in What is Floating, and you can learn everything you want to learn about flotation therapy. In fact, I actually just came out of a float because uh, I did a podcast, the second TEDx Stanley Park podcast, a few hours ago. And I was feeling kind of tired because I woke up at like 3 in the morning and I couldn't get back to sleep. And I kind of woke up and did some email work and then... You know, I booked a float, and luckily there was one available in between podcasts. So I had a little cat nap in between <laughs> the podcasts, which is really nice. But um, I find on nights when I haven't had a lot of sleep, or I've been working really hard, or uh, just just really busy, and I don't, I can't get out of town. Um, a float is super restorative. It's like that ninety minutes of like complete silence and uh, uh, decompression and relaxation. And I find if I can get that in. Even when I'm in a really busy period, it really helps me manage my stress and really helps me feel restored and more rested. So if you'd like to give that a try, use the promo code VancouverReal and that will get you a 20% discount on a single float. And as usual, I have to give a shout out to the Vancouver Real community. Um, the Vancouver Real community is a group of people and people who generally listen to the podcast who get together uh, once a month on average and we do different workshops and they're all for free. And we change them up. So sometimes we'll do a nutrition workshop, a fitness workshop, maybe a meditation, or uh, maybe a SEO workshop. We always change it up, but they're always free. And uh, the idea is to bring a little bit of community behind the podcast. So it's nice to have the, the online platform, but at the same time, it's nice to actually put a face to a name and, uh, and meet some people. So if you'd like to find a really fantastic community of people who are very like-minded and open and, and just uh, looking generally to better their lives in some way, shape, or form, come out to one of the Vancouver Real meetups. And you can link up uh, with us by going to the website, vancouverreal.tv, and going under the events section. And you can see all the events and meetups that we have coming up. And finally, I have to mention Mindful Mass. And currently, we have a 30-day meditation challenge going on. So what Mindful Mass is, is a, a meditation group. And what we do is we go around to public places in the city, and we sit down, and we do giant mass meditations. And they're always spontaneous. That's very cool. Yeah, we were actually um, inspired by the Big Quiet. Have you heard of them out of New York? Nope, I haven't. No, so what they are is a, a group basically that started going to public spaces and doing these mass meditations. Of course, getting permits and everything that you need to do to do that. But um, I was like, that's really cool. We should get this going in Vancouver. And I made a little post on social media and somebody said, well, that shouldn't be too hard to do in the city. I'm like, you're right. It should be pretty easy. So I started up the, the group. We found an amazing local meditation teacher, Carolyn Budgel. And uh, we host quarterly. Basically, we try to hit all the solstices and equinoxes. Um, and we go, yeah, you know, like I said, quarterly, and we have giant mass public meditations with like a little bit of socializing afterwards. So, uh, if meditation is something you want to get into, that's a, a good group to get involved with. It's just um, Mindful Mass Vancouver Meditation Mob. The group is on Facebook as well, and uh, like I said, we have a 30-day challenge going on. So, it's not too late to hop on. You can start anytime you want. And basically, what we're doing is we're uh, we're, we're, we're asking people to meditate for 10 minutes a day and to try to make that into a habit and a ritual in your life. And it's one of those things that, um, you know, it's very easy not to do, but it's also very easy to do if you can just schedule that time in. Like 10 minutes goes by in a blink when you get into a meditation practice. Sometimes it doesn't feel like that, but for the most part, it goes by really quickly. And um, it's a great practice to have, and it's just a way to bring a little bit more calm and presence into your life. So... Again, that's uh, Mindful Mass. You can go to mindfulmass.org. It's the website to uh, stay up to date on any events that we'll be hosting. So today, as I mentioned, this is the third installment of the TEDx Stanley Park series. And I have Zumani... Zamana. Zamana. <laughs> Zamana. a couple of syllables here, Zamana but you're close. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes. I almost got that right. And you know what? I, honestly, it happens every time, right? It's all but good. It happens all every good. time. But... Um, you are uh, doing a TEDx Stanley Park talk on March 3rd. Yes, I am. Yeah, and you're currently a student at UBC as well. Yes. And uh, let's just dive right in. And what is the, uh, the topic of your talk, and what, what are you going to be chatting about that day? 
Sure. So my topic, that talk, um, and the title is uh, Why I'm Not Your Muslim. Um, and so basically the theme is all about my experiences with racial identity um, and then discrimination. And then how do we move forward from that and use tangible acts of kindness as a method to remove our inherent judgment, our inherent bias, and then the prejudice that we bring with us when we view people in the world. So tangible acts of kindness. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit more on what that means? Absolutely. Well, I mean, it's really tough to say that there is a solution to problems like this. It's a huge problem. And it's, I mean, I can only speak from the Muslim experience, but I know that there are so many minorities and so many of my brothers and sisters who are, you know, facing very different, um, but similar in the fact that, you know, the struggle of judgment and being judged is a common thread that unites what a lot of people are facing now. And there's a lot of movements in politics and the social sphere to be said on that topic. Um, and so I guess my way of sort of addressing this in my personal life is to really adopt compassion as a value that I incorporate within my own character and then will hopefully encourage the audience to do when they walk out of my talk that at the end of the day, you know, you can't really solve something as big as racism, but you can look within yourself and ask yourself why you judge and who you look at and why you look at them the way you do. And I think the, that introspection is the first step, that whole asking why is the first step for us to really move forward and bring the conversation beyond like, okay, you know, what do we fix and what policies do we fix, which is all important, but it also brings it forward to be like, okay, like, why, why am I thinking this or like who am I thinking this about and how can I break that cycle and I think we don't ask ourselves those questions enough so that's so hopefully the conversation that I hope to start on March 3rd right so again it is asking those intro introspective questions and trying to understand ourselves a little bit more as well and, and yeah, looking absolutely. at why maybe we have those maybe even unconscious biases that are running sometimes and, and where they come from and uh, I guess I guess the key part would be identifying them to start off. Would you agree? Absolutely. I think identifying that this is a problem is the first step in knowing that, you know, we have to find a solution. And I think it's really tough. It's easier said than done. I mean, acknowledging these biases within us is super, super difficult. And I mean, I have to always, like when I'm telling you this, I do it myself and I have to always go back and be like, well, okay, am I being authentic to what I'm saying right now? And am I viewing the world in that lens as well. And so I think it's a constant inner struggle, um, which is why I love in the beginning when you were talking about meditation and mindfulness, um, that we don't have, like those practices are really important for some people to connect back to those values and to allow them to really recognize that everybody at the end of the day is just human. Yeah, totally. Like when it comes to the meditation and mindfulness aspect of the whole thing, um, what I find it allows you to do is really start uh, being an observer of what you're thinking about as opposed to just just randomly thinking about things and having a stream of consciousness, right? So Absolutely. it's like when you can sit back and observe it, that's when you can potentially catch yourself. And that's why I think meditation is such a, a great skill to teach people because it's like if you can Yeah, just... you can take your, you can truly like take yourself into somebody else's shoes if you can take yourself out of that perspective and see the biggest like picture. And I, I mean, I'm not an expert and I'm sure you could comment further on it, but I know one of the you know, the thoughts that is sort of going through in psychology right now is not just, you know, to let your thoughts go in to try and solve it, but to let them be there, to think them. To observe and them. And then to observe them yeah. in that space. Mm -hmm. And so that's also really useful um, when you're looking at something like, you know, social justice and bias and like how do you not stereotype people is like okay how are you like let's take a step back and observe the kind of thoughts that you're thinking and yeah. then work to break that cycle so i think it's there's definitely an interconnection to that which is why totally. i thought what you said was really cool yeah um and also it's, it gives you a little bit of space to not react so much so it's like you can maybe you know you, People are going to have emotions, right? We're going to have an emotion. It's going to well up inside of us. But it's like, okay, so you're having that emotion. Well, what do you do with it at that point? You know, it's, it's very easy to, you know, fly off the handle, see something you're going to regret or whatever. But it's like if you can just acknowledge that emotion when it's coming up and just take a step back and like just not react right away, I think that's a huge um, part of the equation. Of course. Yeah. Of and, course. I, and I was just curious if you could dive into a little more around that idea around having compassion. Is that having compassion towards uh, 
people like in general who you might encounter in life? Or is that also even having compassion towards people who haven't reached that level of understanding yet? That's a really interesting question. I think it's a bit of both. So I think um, like in our everyday lives, you know, I'm sure the people listening to this podcast aren't the kind of people who would, you know, throw a tomato at someone on the street and be like, oh, go back to where you came mm, from. No, no. But um, I do think that there are, you know, we do think things and we do act in certain ways that allow us to, you know, perpetuate this cycle of racism. I mean, as a business owner, you are probably well aware of the fact that, you know, diversity in the corporate sphere is very much lacking. And there's a lot of lot to be said about, you know, hiring someone who looks, you know, like a different color or a different race or different religion um, or a different, you know, image who may be more qualified, but looks that way when you're looking for sort of you know, in your mind when we have all these stereotypes of how people should look when they're applying to certain positions. Totally. And so I think when you talk about compassion, um, like compassion is definitely, shouldn't be a substitute to acknowledging that when you think those thoughts, they're wrong. So it's not being like, oh, well, I'm compassionate to you, which is why I'm going to just tolerate you. Like that's not the compassion we're looking at. We're looking at more um, sort of empathy on a very deep level, um, which is tougher to get to, but it's sort of the empathy that you reach when you really realize that everybody at the end of the day has a story and everybody is on the same playing field. And that compassion can also manifest, I mean, obviously, like like you mentioned earlier, um, like it can ma- doesn't necessarily need to manifest in, this, in these situations. I mean, when you're on the street on, you know, in downtown and you see a homeless man um, and you just walk by him really quickly and don't make eye contact, there is something to be said about having compassion in that scenario as well. Or just making eye contact, acknowledging that that person is human is one step closer and sort of building that muscle of, you know, looking at the world judgment free. Um, and I mean, we're always going to look, you know, and discern people and we're always going to see color. Like that's never going to go away, but it's how we react to it and how we act to it. So compassion in that way and then practicing that in order to make ourselves just better humans and like, you know, better able to sort of look at everybody for who they are and not what they wear or the melanin on their skin, um, I think is a really important tool. And I know you mentioned previously like compassion towards people who may not understand. I mean, I I think that is, of course, important, but I think it's also, like, it's also important to realize that, you know, it can be quite exhausting to always have to justify yourself to everybody. And so there's compassion, but also consideration where you have to really take that into account where, you know, if something wrong is being done, it's not necessarily the fault, like, you know, the responsibility of the victim in that situation. Being a bystander and seeing something also is where that compassion plays a role when you, you know, inter- interject, when you're strong and when you're sort of, you know, looking after a person in that scenario. And it can be in like, you know, a physical or a really, you know, in, in a really, sometimes, you know, there are hostile si- situations that go on. There was one that happened a few weeks ago on the Canada line. Um, which was absolutely horrible. But there are also more subtle situations where you know you get eye contact or body language that can lend itself to sort of, you know, like not the best judgment where you sort of know something is off. And I think that's where you can also bring in the values of compassion as well. So definitely it's a it's a broad topic and I hope to narrow it down quite a bit and make it really specific within the talk. Um, But it's definitely not a be-all, end-all, and there's so many components of it that you can look at. But it's really something that I think if you want to take something away um, in terms of, you know, advocacy and activism, it all starts with this whole idea that we need to just dethrone ourselves from the center of the universe and sort of look at the shoes, look at ourselves in the shoes of another person, which is why, you know, and you mentioned as well that like meditation helps you do that. There are so many things that help you do that. So it's all about sort of starting those conversations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, One of the practices I've been doing for uh, several years now is uh, at least acknowledging homeless people on the streets when I see them. Absolutely. I think it's so important. I mean, you don't necessarily have to give them something. Once in a while, I do. Yeah. But um, for the most part, I uh, always make an effort to acknowledge them. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing that I'll do, too, is I will... If I'm like at a crosswalk or something and I have a few minutes and they're sitting there and they have some change, I'll just be like, hey, how's your day going? 
and that's, that's a bit awesome. of yeah, I do that too. That's and a I, bit of a loaded question sometimes because yeah, you never know what kind of ball of wax you're opening up when you ask that question. Mm -hmm. But at least you ask, and it's like even if you can't sit there and, and talk to the person, it's like it shows like it shows that they're human. You're acknowledging them as a human, right? So Absolutely. it's a it's a practice where. Uh, you know, especially in the downtown east side, we, we have fairly regularly, you can go down here and course, walk down the street course. and do it 10 yeah. times on one street, you know? Absolutely, uh, you know? yeah, yeah. Yeah, but um, in another place, this is a little bit lighter, but in traffic, you can practice compassion because it's like <laughs> you never know why yeah. somebody cut you off or why they're rushing right, or yeah, whatever, right? Because yeah. it's just like... Don't honk. Well, I mean, sometimes it's good to honk, but... <laughs> yeah, like you don't really know, right? That person could be like going to an emergency or in an emergency or who knows, right? So it's just like most likely not, mm -hmm. however, but mm -hmm. it's like, you know, if I let that reaction, that emotional reaction make me really upset that's that's not going to help me at all so it's like when i notice that reaction bubbling up that's when i use like a meditation technique of becoming really present and just letting it go and then uh you know uh and then just kind of moving on with my day as opposed to right, getting wrapped right. up in it right um so i'd like to get into why are you uh personally motivated uh to give this talk that's a really interesting question i mean this is i mean i don't nor like I'm not an expert in sort of psychology and in, in the realm academically, but I guess the motivation just comes from personal experience and like personal um, sort of journeys with seeing other people um, that I know who are experiencing judgments like this, Muslim or not Muslim. I don't think it's like a issue that's just defined by my own identity. Um, but I think that's, that's where my motivation comes. I mean, like you mentioned earlier, I'm a student. Um, I have like an intense, you know, passion for you know like business and like you know going into healthcare and so like by day I definitely you know focus a lot on that focus on like those issues that also matter to me but I also feel like you can never really you know pull the two apart that at the end of the day like we are a global society and we are global citizens and I feel like whatever happens in any part of the world like should also touch us deeply and sometimes we remove ourselves from you know problems happening down south or problems happening elsewhere and we're like oh well this is not a Canadian thing this is not a Vancouver thing um but it definitely is and it definitely manifests its ugly head in situations we often wouldn't expect so I think it's important for me and to sort of um, go through that own process of like, you know, looking at my experiences and my life and the people that I know and the people that I've met across this sort of six months journey of preparing for this talk, but also um, in spreading that message that at the end of the day, like I am very, very normal. And the fact that I'm giving this talk isn't because I, you know, have a government position or isn't because, you know, I'm a lawyer, but it's because um, I've definitely witnessed it and seen it and know that it's a human problem and not something that should just be limited to pieces of paper and articles and things we retweet, but something we need to start acting now. Absolutely. Um, it's definitely a, a good time in history to do that. And things have definitely been inflamed with, uh, you know, situations in the U.S. and, 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 and to a lesser extent in Canada. But yes, like you're right, they're, they're here for sure. Yeah, I think even like um, in Canada, like you can definitely see it's, it's everywhere. Like, I mean, if we say it's just, you know, it's their problem. Yeah. I don't think that's doing justice to what we've seen already, like, you know, this week in the news and, you know, elsewhere. It's definitely a epidemic. So um, if you could, if you could take a guess, like where would, where do you think or what causes someone to maybe not understand somebody? Let's just say it that way. You know what I mean? What, where, where do you, where do you think that comes from in people? What's, what's the root of it? If you could put your finger on that. I really can't put my finger on that because I think it's different for everyone. You could put like a, you know, a multifactorial argument to it. You could say that upbringing has an issue, location has an issue, like for example, like the people you're surrounded with, um, like you know, if you're if you grow up in Antarctica, like it would be really weird for you to see someone like other than you know like wearing full parka, like someone with just like you know a casual t-shirt and shorts would be weird for someone who's lived in Antarctica for so long. Yeah. So as a mundane an example as that, I guess that could also factor in you know environment upbringing, who we talk to, who we surround ourselves with, the media we consume, and the types of media consume, consumed by us. Um, there are so many factors. It's tough to say that there's a root to it all. Mm -hmm. Because the moment you say, oh, well, it's this, 
you're automatically saying, well, okay, well, I haven't, you know, my, like, I have lived in a super diverse place. Like, I'm not part of the problem. That's just people who've lived in Antarctica. Yeah. But that's totally not the case. It's yeah. um, all of us just in different degrees and different forms. Yep. Yeah. You're okay. I'm just adjusting levels. You're fine. Okay. Um, okay. So now you must be pretty busy because you're a full-time student. And uh, yes, you're also preparing for these talks. And I know Roger does a really thorough job of preparing his speakers for a talk. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's lots of rehearsal and practice and coaching and all sorts of different things. So how, uh, how have you uh, handled that? How have you managed like, taking on the stress of uh, a TEDx Stanley Park talk in front of a big audience with you know, lots of people and being a full-time student? Uh, how is that going for you? going really well um i think it's uh, like opened up new avenues of conversation even within my student life i mean i've always found a lot of support within my friends and my youth community and i've always been really involved at ubc and just it's a wonderful vibrant community with people who are so passionate about changing their world as i know like cliche and kumbaya as that sound like they're just some amazing people and so the fact that i've had this like opportunity um given to me and it's just the most wonderful opportunity um it has just opened so many more conversations within my university experience as well like talking to people who are like hey i'm so happy you're doing this because here's what i've gone through and like oh like that's your story like my story is so similar like here's what i'm going through um and it's just allowed me to really listen and learn from a lot of people's different experiences and just reaffirm the fact that this is such a big issue and that it's so it's so wide in its scope and it's a difficult issue to talk about because whenever we talk about it we always say oh it's like it's those racists like it's them it's the other and we never include ourselves in that um in that sort of category and so i think it's well nobody really wants to think of themselves that totally, way do they? It totally it's, it's not an appealing title like it's definitely not something you'd put on your resume like, no yeah no. <laughs> former racist no i'm <laughs> Definitely Unless that. you were like a former racist that was going around speaking and explaining how why you changed or something like that. Well, but yeah, then maybe you would. Then maybe you would. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But, so how many times have you practiced your speech? Oh, Andy. Oh, um, I'm not sure. Um, I like it's like whenever I get a chance, really. I mean, like maybe weekly. I think at this stage because um, the earlier months were just like preparing what I was going to say. And again, like I said, like doing a lot of that conversational piece, like talking to people and like, you know, learning about the scope of this issue and how it affects our city, how it affects, you know, different people. So a lot of it was just, you know, the prep work behind giving a talk like this. Um, you definitely want to do justice to the issue. Yeah. Um, and it's really difficult to do that, um, especially with such a large scope of what you're trying to say and like you know the message behind it is like obviously like very deep and like very serious so you know it's important for me because i'm like you know i like to consider myself a really energetic like cheerful person to incorporate elements of like humor and elements of like okay like let's let's sort of like deconstruct these huge words and like let's really like look at it in our everyday life um so in terms of the balance, I've really found that that's helped me as well, like pace how much I practice and like when I write. But yeah, overall, I would say I have a lot of practicing left to do. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, and have you done much public speaking before? Um, I have. Yeah. So I, um, I've done a lot of public speaking. I actually, when I was uh, a bit younger, like still in high school, I did another TEDx talk. Um, which was uh, sort of about humanitarianism and my like experiences in international volunteering. Which one was that? Um, it was TEDx Granville Youth. Okay. So nice. it was like a youth TEDx. Um, and yeah, so I did that when I was younger. I've like been doing Model United Nations for a very long time. Um, stopped it in university, but did it a lot in high school. I also used to do debate and bilingual debate as well, so in French. Okay. Yeah. So you're fairly comfortable in front of an audience. Then. So, uh, yeah, I've always really enjoyed public speaking and writing. I enjoy both. And what has the process been like with TEDx Stanley Park in particular? I, I, I know that they're, they're quite rigorous with their selection process Absolutely. and their, prep, <laughs> yeah. their preparation. So what's that been like for you? I've been learning a lot throughout this process. Um, it's, it's definitely been really long, but I think with that 
uh, with those, you know, repetitive practices and rehearsals, like, you definitely, it definitely keeps you on guard. Like, if there's, like, you know, a moment where your speech falls or a moment where your ideas don't make sense, somebody somewhere will call you out on it, which mm. is really nice because then at least you won't go, like, a, you won't go a month without, you know, saying the wrong thing or thinking the wrong thing. Someone will be like, yo, that doesn't make sense. And so that's the really good part about it. But it's, it's long, yeah. It really does polish you up, right? Um, yeah, one thing uh, has always been a comfort to me in any kind of public speaking situation is that you know your speech inside and out, yeah. but the audience doesn't. So it's like, even if you do mess up a sentence or you know misplace a word or something yeah. like that, uh, for the most part, the audience has no idea that you did that. And if you just continue on and pick up where you left off, I find it's just like you can just kind of keep yeah, going yeah. and nobody knows, right? Maybe the people who have heard your, your speech 10 times already might notice. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I find that people, you know, another thing too uh, is that uh, audiences typically want to see you succeed, you know? So they're, they are sort of rooting for you. So it's like once you, once you start feeling that from them and you see that they're kind of behind you and they're engaged, um, it becomes a lot easier because it's like, yes, they actually care about what I'm saying. Yes, they like me, whatever. You know what I mean? So I think that uh, it's an amazing exercise, and especially being so young, like getting up there on the big stage already. That's, that's pretty I don't impressive. I feel young, Andy. I feel kind of old. Well, maybe you're an old soul. I don't know. <laughs> I think but, I probably am, and that's probably where it comes from. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so uh, what else, what kind of advice would you give to somebody who might uh, be listening to this podcast or um, who might be in school still and... You know, they, they want to be where you are. They want to be at, uh, on a TED stage, a TEDx stage sometimes. You know, how, how could you, what advice would you give to that person that would help get them there? Oh, man. I mean, like, where I am is, like, not that special, Andy. I mean, I'm sort of doing what I'm passionate about, and I sort of let my passions guide the opportunities that I've sought out for myself. So I guess my advice to any person my age would be, yeah, like, find, find those things that, you know, like make you take like that you know are really passionate yeah, that you're really passionate about and we often have this idea that passion has got to be like this one thing like I'm passionate about big tech so I'm gonna just do big tech my whole life and I don't think it's like that like right now this is what I'm really passionate about um and I know for you maybe your passions when you were my age were one thing and then maybe 10 years down the road they're completely different completely different so totally and mm -hmm. i know we had this conversation before the podcast as well yeah and i think it's really important that it's not about like being on a tedx stage i feel like you know it sounds really cool but it's all a process and you know if you want something then you will hustle and it's about you know like knowing that you want that thing before you go into that hustle and so for me i think it's just been about like hustling my whole life and like you know trying to get whatever I can out of the experiences that I'm given um, and that it's not about, you know, what stage you're on or what talk you do or what social media you're featured. I, like for me, that's not important for me. It's if I'm making a difference um, and, you know, if I'm doing good work and tangible work and at the end of the day, like that's what matters. And I feel like, you know, if I'm on this stage and, you know, like that and if that helps, then that's that's awesome. But it's definitely not the only way to make change. I respect so many, so many young people my age who are just, um, like, you know, doing school, volunteering, like doing the best that they can in sports. I mean, I'm super unathletic. So I mean, like, I couldn't do that. So I respect that of them. So I don't think it's about like what I'm doing or who I am. Like who I am is just where I am right now, but it's not necessarily who other people are. So I don't think it's about getting on a TEDx, not to discredit it at all because it's a wonderful conference, but for people my age, it's about like keep doing what you're doing and be confident that it's not about what other people are doing or what other people say or, you know, don't compare yourself to others. I don't think that's a good idea at all. Definitely. It's about your passions, what you want to do um, and what you can do, what's like good for you and like, you know, what feels good and, you know, what's what's feasible and sort of and, you know, keeping your mental health also in check because I know that's tough for people my age. Yeah, the mental health thing is, is a big one for sure because stress definitely compounds. Yeah, and for I, sure. I've, I've heard of this really, really great uh, business. It's called Float House, and they're really <laughs> good at managing You're stress. You're really good at plugging, <laughs> Andy. I think you should go into sales. I've maybe done it before, just a couple <laughs> times. 
but no seriously though getting like staying on top of your stress as a student is is super important totally. um, and yeah. for everybody in general just stress does some pretty terrible things to the brain yeah, yeah, so sure. if you can you know stay on top of that that's definitely important so yeah. you know you're a very passionate and bright you know young mind and i'm just curious thank so, you. so are have, you have, <laughs> thank you have you have you given much thought about uh, you know what the future holds for you like what what you might want to do after school i know uh, i know students the, hate the that question the ultimate question you probably what are you going to do when you grow up you're like your parents probably ask you that all the time and no my like, parents are really awesome they're just like you know you do what you want to do in the present. Like they're super, they're super supportive. It's actually, I think probably like I'm the one who puts that pressure on me. Like, oh, I gotta figure it out. I gotta figure it out. Yeah. Because so many people I know are like, oh, this is what I want to do, and they just go do they it. They just know. And it's so awesome. Like I'm so happy for them. But I just know that I'm not in that boat. <laughs> so yeah. my answer to you at this point is I don't know. Um, like for sure, there are definitely like some realms which I'm really interested in. Like you mentioned before, I am a student. I am studying global health and psychology with my master's of management at UBC. So I have a real passion for um, like, you know, mental illness and um, physiology and psychology, um, but bringing that together with um, my love for business as well and like marketing and designing solutions, um, I would love to combine them both um, in a career but I'm also um, open to just using the skills that I'm learning through this process, through this conference, um, and also through like you know, the other things that I do in just a career that will make um, like a positive social change. I think for me, it's not necessarily about what do I want to be, but who do I want to be? Hmm. And so for me, the who is really important um, to find out exactly like, you know, who I am and those values. And I think that will dictate where I go. When you think about the who, if you could, if you could say, who are you at this point, you know, how would you answer that question? That's a really deep question. See, I think I'm just like going down this rabbit hole myself. Yeah, you are. <laughs> it's fine though. It makes for good conversation. It does. It does. I mean, if you ask me, then I'd like to ask you back as well, but like, I'll try and give it a shot. Um, so the who I, who I am, I think the main thing that really describes who I am is balance. I really think about balance in everything that I do, um, be it my academics, be it family, friends, um, and also my community, which is really important to me and giving back to my community um, and giving back even to the city. Uh, so for me, volunteering has always been a huge value for me. Um, it's how I was raised. It was how I was raised to give back to my community, to serve, to be compassionate, to, you know, be mindful, grateful, all of those awesome adjectives. And I think that describes who I am because I don't want to lead a life that's just all about, you know, individualism. I want to lead a life that's about, you know, improving the lives of others and really giving back, whether that's in a healthcare space. So in terms of, you know, patient care or, you know, improving the lives of people in that way, or even if it's in a business way, like improving systems that improve the lives of people, um, that's who I am, I guess, at this point. But okay. I want to throw that back at you because it's such oh, a you tough question. You can't do question. that. You're the, you're the interviewee. No, I can, I can totally do that. Oh, Give it a shot. Wow. Okay, then okay. let me ask, let me ask like a... Okay, no. Yeah. Well, ask the question. Go ahead. Okay, ask, ask like, a, like a sub-question because that was a tough one you asked me. Okay. So I think I got to get back at you. Oh, okay. Oh, so, man. Here we go. Um, oh, okay. One, if you could describe yourself in one adjective, what would it be? Hmm. See, that was easy. That was good. I gave you such a good question, Andy. Yeah, I would say compassionate. <laughs> yeah. I'd say that's the big one for me. Um, yeah, for you? Yeah, I think uh, I like to... What I like to do, really, is create experiences for people. One adjective. Um, <laughs> well, the, the, I had one word, but I'm just kind of, you know... Yes, per okay, perfect, perfect. Elaborating on why so I chose that word. So now you're telling me who I am. Okay. No, who I am. Who you are, yes. Yeah. So basically, like... I like to create experiences which give people those sort of uh, introspective moments, those, those moments where they question uh, themselves a little bit, question who they are, question what they are, who they think they are. You know, yeah, so many people yeah. get so wrapped up in their own self-identity of this is my job and this is my name, this is you know, where I came from and uh, this is what I like to do and all these different things, how we define ourselves. And I'm like... I'm not so sure that's the answer totally. because those are potentially totally. a lot of them are, you know, conditioned, right? So they're conditioned yeah. responses that we've gained for our entire life. Exactly. And, um, you know, there, there's definitely some 
inherent traits that people carry with them but at the same time a lot of that stuff has been written into us so it's like when you strip all that away and you get down to like the neural neurological level it's like yeah we're a bunch yeah. of neurons firing in our brain it's which tell nuts. us that we're it's these so cool. that tell us that we're these these things that yeah. think we have these identities and if you go down even further past that you start going into like the quantum level where things don't even exist and the rules space. of physics <laughs> also breaking down um and we're all part of that so to answer your question, I don't really know. <laughs> I don't really know. Yeah. But on this physical plane, I feel like I am uh, sort of like, I deliver messages through what I create. And that is Float House, that is Vancouver Real, that is a meditation group. And I think that uh, I, I like to inspire people to, uh, again, to just start asking those questions about themselves, like the questions like who they are. That's so, awesome. So how's that? I Good? love it. So awesome. You Good. took I'm my question and then you... Like, not only did you answer my question, but you also answered the question you gave me. So you did two in one. Oh, so well, perfect. That's impressive. Good for you. Right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So um, so when is the talk again? It's March, March 3rd. March 3rd. Yes. Yeah. And do you know the order, order in which you're speaking yet? Uh, yes. So I'm going to be, like, sort of after the first quadrant, I'm first speaker of, like, the mid-afternoon. So I'm in around noon. You're around noon. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Around like 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. You're going to have a lot of family in the audience cheering you on, a lot of friends. Yeah, yeah. Um, some family and friends, a bit of both. A few teachers as well. And my teachers have always been like some of the most supportive people in my life. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really honored to have some of them come out as well. Would you say you're more nervous or more excited about it? I'll let you know on March 2nd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think right now it hasn't really sunk in yet. Mm -hmm. Um, March seems so far away for me. I'm like, oh, well, I have to do an assignment on January 27th. So like in my head, it's March is like whew, that far, but it's not. Um, it's definitely really close. So for me, I think it's a bit of both nervous excitement, um, but also a lot of focus and preparing hard. Yeah. You know, one thing I think about that nervous excitement sort of energy is uh, the two are very interchangeable. You know, you can be nervous and you can be like, am I 10% excited and 90% nervous or am I 90% excited and 10% nervous? And it's really hard to tell the difference. And I think a lot of it is our frame. You know, it's like, you know, I like to think of things of instead of coming from the space of, you know, I have to do this, come from a space of I want to do this or even I get to do this. And when you kind of flip around that frame a little bit, I really find it helps with like the nerves and, uh, you know, switching that around from nervousness to excitement. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really good way of thinking about yeah. it. So um, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to, to share with people while you're here? No, um, I'm super excited to give this talk. Thank you for having me. Um, final thoughts? Oh, there this is, go. again, you ask all the tough questions. Um, I think, you know, if anyone listening to this really wants to start practicing this on their own, again, like sort of what we talked about at the beginning, really, you know, get involved with not only introspection, but also learning about different cultures and faiths that may not have been, you know, something that you've known about before. I think, you know, research and knowledge and asking people, asking questions is one of the greatest ways that we can learn to bridge these um, barriers of ignorance between us. Because at the end of the day, you know, you solve ignorance through knowledge and sharing that knowledge only increases it. It doesn't decrease. Um, which is what I love about it. So when you share that information, um, I think that's a wonderful way of, you know, spreading word and, you know, doing your research, asking those questions. If you really find that you're in a place where you don't know a lot about a certain culture, you want to find out more. Um, but also to ask those questions, you know, respectfully. Um, and again, like compassion with consideration. So like, you know, you know, be aware of, you know, people's space and time. But I think those are really crucial things that, you know, people listening want to start engaging in would definitely help with this whole process of eliminating stereotype and judgment. And again, these are big words that we really can't eliminate with, you know, with, you know, just, you know, if you're just kind and, you know, that won't eliminate racism. There's a lot of layers and facets to it. Um, but definitely practicing that compassion. I love what you do, um, and I do it as well. Like, you know, going and acknowledging, like being like, hey, like, I hope you have a great day. Or 
those kind of actions um, just on our streets because I know you know when we're talking about Vancouver it's so important to focus on those local issues and it's so important to focus on humanizing those local issues so that we can be part of the solution and if we always look at you know it as this you know big intangible like you know thing that we can't solve then it sort of alienates us and again creates an us and them so even right now within our city to practice that act of active kindness and active compassion and I love that it's what you stand for as well um, and I mean it's what I stand for as well I start a nonprofit on it I you know volunteer and it's something that's so important to me it's also something I'm always learning about and always humbled when I hear other people's stories like yourself um, it definitely inspires me and so thank you so much for sharing a little bit about yourself as well on the show and I'm super excited to hopefully have you come out on March 3rd. Oh, I will be there. Yeah, I'll be there. Oh, perfect. Roger Killen will make sure of it. Perfect. I'm <laughs> glad Roger's got you on there. That's awesome. Yeah, no, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. It's always great. Um, the amount of work that goes into these productions, people really don't know how much work goes. That's why they're so polished. You know, Roger's whole thing is uh, his, his standard of excellence is how many standing ovations he gets mm. and or the speakers get. And uh, last year they went 16 for 16. So I know when he gets that, he's a happy camper. Oh, absolutely. He's wonderful. So that's awesome. Good for you. Absolutely. Well, thanks a lot for joining us today. My pleasure. And uh, as usual, if you uh, like what you heard today, please give us a, a like, a comment, and a share or even a review on iTunes, YouTube, or Stitcher. That really goes a long way in helping us get found in this giant sea that we call the internet. And of course, if you want to try floating, go to floathouse.ca, use the promo code VancouverReal. That will get you a 20% discount on a single float. And um, uh, link up with us at the Vancouver, uh, Vancouver Real meetups and the Mindful Mass Meditations. We have too many groups going on. I can't keep track of all of them. It's insane. So um, until next time, do whatever is.